Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Is that really true? You know, have you been hurt by somebody's words? Have you ever hurt somebody else with your words? Well, of course, the truth is we've been hurt and we've hurt others. When it comes to talking about how we're doing with our lives, every one of us would rather be complimented rather than criticized, wouldn't we? Because criticism stings and confrontations have the reputation of being ugly. So it can be hard to believe that they serve any good purpose in our lives. An elderly man was in the hospital with his wife of 55 years sitting right beside him. And he said, is that you Ethel at my side again? Yes, dear, she said. He said softly back to her, remember years ago when I was in the veterans hospital? You were with me then. You were also with me when we lost everything in the fire. And Ethel, when we were poor, you stuck with me then too. Come to think of it, Ethel, since you're still with me, you must be bad luck. <laughs> it's hard to be around people who always seem to be finding fault with you. Some criticism is stinging and not helpful at all. It's like the pastor who got up on Sunday morning to preach and he apologized because he had this big band-aid on his face. He said, I was thinking about my sermon while shaving and I cut my face. Well, later that week he found a note in the offering plate that said, next time, think about your face and cut the sermon. No matter what you do, you're going to get some criticism and it's not always delivered in the best way. David Getz is a writer and he says, on a fly fishing trip, with still about an hour in the truck before arriving home, my fishing buddy offhandedly observed that I was overly sensitive to criticism. He listed a couple of instances, including my response to some of my reviews for my writing. Suddenly, the truck felt cramped. I snapped back that debating others about what they say about me or what I do, that's not being overly sensitive. I asked him to give more specific examples, which I then debunked. Hurt, I withdrew from the conversation and nursed my new wound from an old friend. In the years since then, I've glacially come to another layer of insight. Not only am I oversensitive to criticism, I also like to play consultant to others. So none of us like to be criticized, and, and maybe we're too quick to give it to others, or more often the problem may be oversensitivity, or even a lack of sensitivity. Listening to criticism, however, can be a lifesaver, even though it's hurtful. Charles Spurgeon once said bluntly, get a friend to tell you your faults, or better still, welcome an enemy who will watch you keenly and sting you savagely. What a blessing such an irritating critic will be to a wise person, but what an intolerable nuisance he will be to a fool. Well, Solomon said it this way in Proverbs 15, 31. He said, if you listen to constructive criticism, you'll be at home among the wise. If you reject discipline, you only harm yourself. But if you listen to correction, you grow in understanding. Here's some more wisdom about criticism. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us consider how to inspire each other to greater love and to righteous deeds, not forgetting to gather as a community as some have forgotten, but encouraging one another, one another especially as his day of return approaches. So what I'd like to do today is reframe criticism as the giving and receiving of loving inspiration. Because that's really what it should be about. When criticism is offered or received, it should be done in a loving manner and it should inspire rather than deflate. Healthy criticism, constructive criticism, is loving criticism. And it helps, it builds up rather than tears down. It encourages people to be their best. And so you can think of it this way. 
criticism properly given and properly received, it saves lives. True love warns people about danger. If you care about somebody, you will confront them with the truth, not because you want to hurt them, but because you want to spare them further hurt. Nobody, I think, wants to truly upset somebody else. We fear telling each other the truth sometimes more than we fear the safety of other people's souls. As the writer of the Hebrews says, we need to consider how to give criticism that motivates people to live God's way. And so if you're wise, you'll be open to receiving godly criticism, or what we are calling today, loving inspiration. If you're not, you're only hurting yourself. Dr. Daniel Brown says Christians who are never reproved usually harbor some instability or unsoundness in their faith. Like sheep, we are all prone to wonder. The problem is, when people wonder, we have another tendency. And that tendency is we look the other way. You know, if I just ignore this problem, then it's going to go away. Most problems, however, that need to be confronted just don't disappear. Infections don't get better by themselves. Without being treated, they get worse. And so in every relationship, we make a choice. We choose between the pain of fear or the pain of love. The pain of fear has us tiptoeing around the truth. Instead of walking with grace and truth, fear has us walking on eggshells. Fear has us focused on how honesty might hurt, but love wants, love wants what's best for our friend or loved one. Love cannot afford to be cautious or to tiptoe around. Love considers how keeping quiet just might destroy somebody else's life. What we overlook in unbelievers in our attempts to love them the way God wants us to is exactly what we must not overlook for believers to help keep them in God's kingdom. Like David, we all need a Nathan who will lovingly tell us the truth. We are to encourage one another daily so that we're not hardened by sin's deceitfulness. In God's family, we are responsible for each other. We are to admonish and teach each other with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. Being teachable and open to loving inspiration is really the sign of a mature person. Listen to what Solomon says several times in Proverbs. This is from Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool seems right to him, but the wise man listens to advice. And then in Proverbs 17, 10, a rebuke impresses a man of discernment more than a hundred lashes a fool. And then in Proverbs 9, 9, he says, instruct a wise man and he will be wiser still. Teach a righteous man and he will add to his learning. Wisdom recognizes that there is always something to learn from criticism. You may not agree with your critic, but if there is something to learn, there is something there. If nothing else, you may learn something about yourself by how, how you react to the criticism. I think David learned this right after he had been criticized by Nathan. Psalm 141.5, he says, Let a righteous man strike me, it is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is oil on my head. And my head will not refuse it. Constructive criticism or loving inspiration is kindness with a sting. It is a kindness that saves. Even when somebody offers their thoughts with unkind motives, it can be helpful to us if we have the humility to listen and discern what is true. Now, it might be difficult to accept criticism as kindness unless we focus on the cross. In the cross, we receive God, God's ultimate criticism of our lives. The cross is a criticism of our lives without God. It declares in Romans 3.10, there is no one righteous, not even one. We have all thoroughly failed him. Nobody can criticize me more than God can. 
Whatever charge somebody else makes against you, it's only a fraction of what confronted us on the cross of Christ. Without God's criticism in our lives, we stand condemned and with no hope. We're lost in our sins. We're slaves to our lusts and desires. We're victims of our own rebellion. Without godly criticism in our lives, we're blind to our true condition. We avoid facing the truth. We run the risk of becoming self-destructive. We can be foolish and prideful. We keep making the same mistakes over and over again. We fail to live up to our potential. And we stop listening to the voice of God. How important it is that we receive God's criticism. To be a Christian means I have stood under the greatest criticism of all, God's. And I must be, I must agree with it. You know, guilty as charged. I'm a sinner. I'm a lawbreaker. I deserve death. Do you see how radical this is? Can we see all human accusations in light of the greatest accusation made against us? It literally could be a kindness that saves. Thank God that the cross not only condemned me, it restored me. If you respond to, to God's criticism wisely, you not only agree I deserve death, but you also agree I don't deserve this new life that I have. God's criticism doesn't just condemn me. Ultimately, his loving inspiration expressed toward us and his acceptance saves us. So how do we respond to criticism as believers should be different than how a person responds who has not accepted God's criticism. You know, criticism is not easy to take no matter how it happens or who gives it. We're fragile souls. The credibility of the person who criticizes you makes all the difference. The spirit in which you are criticized makes a big difference. Yet, at times, even your best critics do not do a good job of criticizing you. Sometimes we all fail at being God's spokesman to one another. So how do we go about loving our critics? Well, one thing we can do is, is we can face the criticism with confidence. Because no criticism against you can be greater, as we've already said, than God's criticism on the cross. A criticism that you should already be in agreement with. As a person who's received God's criticism, you can receive human criticism with this attitude, you know, this is only a fraction of my shortcomings. Christ has said a whole lot more about my foolishness, my sins, my rebellion against him than anybody else can ever say against me. But too many times we face criticism with criticism instead of confidence. We react against what people say about us, whether they do a good job of saying it or not. We get defensive or offended, and we go off maybe in a huff. It's a challenge to love people when they rub you the wrong way. Someone has said to love God is not a miracle because he is absolutely lovely. It's loving people that's the miracle because we're not always so lovely. All too often we're surprised by this when we shouldn't be. So when a brother or sister in Christ says something to us or criticizes us in an all too human way, we can react back. And usually we overreact. You know, people leave churches all the time because they react with criticism instead of confidence. You know, going to another church, that's not gonna solve the problem. You're gonna find unlovely people over there too. And when you start attending, they have one more. So another thing we can do to love our critics is we can discern the spirit of the criticism. Not every critic has your best interests in mind, and you already know that. So you need to consider the source. It's not just what's being said, it's also who is saying it. Solomon in Proverbs 27 verses 5 and 6 says, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. It's the criticism that you're receiving from a friend who could be trusted with your soul, or is it from someone who just wants you to cater to their expectations? 
One pastor talked about receiving critical letters in the mail signed by a person who called himself the thorn. Attached to the note was an explanation since he said the Apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh. He felt he should be the pastor's thorn. <laughs> well, the pastor hoped to find out who the thorn was because he wanted to write an anonymous letter back that said the hedge trimmer. You know, some people, they just want to be a thorn in your side. Abraham Lincoln said about his critics, if I were to read much less answer all the tax against me, this shop might well be closed for any other business. He says, I do, do the very best I know how, the very best I can, and I mean to keep doing so until the end. And if the end brings out that I was wrong, 10 angels swearing I was right would make no difference. John Bunyan said, if my life is fruitless, it doesn't matter who praises me. And if my life is fruitful, it doesn't matter who criticizes me. A trusted critic always has your best interests in mind. A trusted critic lovingly inspires you to put your faith in God rather than somewhere else. A trusted critic is not out to embarrass you or humiliate you. A trusted critic speaks to you privately rather than in front of a whole bunch of other people. A trusted critic gives you the benefit of the doubt before hearing you out. A trusted critic doesn't have an ax to grind. A trusted critic sounds a whole lot like the Holy Spirit, respectful and kind. The Holy Spirit doesn't demean us, he doesn't victimize us. He points us toward what we can be in Christ. Another thing you can do is learn from the criticism with an attitude of humility. Even if you are lovingly inspired by the criticism, what can you do to learn from it? Well, the rough edges of another person might be the very tool God uses to sharpen us. What's said might seem to be unfair and even, in some cases, mean-spirited. But could God's voice still be in that critique somewhere? Proverbs 25, 12 says, A wise warning to someone who will listen is as valuable as gold earrings or fine gold jewelry. When King David was criticized by Shimei, he was coming along the edge of where David was walking and, and criticizing him in front of a bunch of other people. David's men wanted to kill him. But David said, Leave him alone. Let him curse, for the Lord has told him so. It may be that the Lord will see my distress and repay me with good for the cursing that I'm receiving today. The actual words that somebody says to you may not be from God, but something they say could benefit you if you're listening to the message. We follow a Savior who was on the receiving end of brutal criticism. It was a criticism far beyond anything that we will ever face because his critics executed him. And so he understands whatever happens to you when it comes to criticism. He's been there. He took the anger that was expressed on a cross and he used it to save us. And so if we know him, he can use critiques and hurts in ways that inspire his love in us in new ways. Because you see, he invites us to himself to take hold of him, to meet him right where he is, because he meets us right where we are. Dawson Trotman, who was the founder of the Navigators, handled all criticisms against him in the same way. No matter how unfair the criticism was, he would go in a room, close the door, get down on his knees before God, and ask, Please, Lord, Show me the kernel of truth in this criticism. The kernel, the kernel of truth could be your own attitude towards the critique and the critic. How willing are you to hear what God may be saying through them? And then there's one more thing. I can respond to godly criticism with surrender. When you get when you get criticized, it's all too easy to get defensive and bitter and pout or shift the blame. But instead, you could learn and grow from it. 
It may be God's way of weeding out pride and purifying your heart. You know, what does God want to change in me? What do I need to surrender or give up? What would please him the most? That should really be our response. Hebrews 12, 5 and 6 says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, because that could be what's coming through your critic. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. And so we should be asking ourselves when criticized, how would a son or God, daughter of God respond to this criticism? Now what usually goes wrong when, we're, when, when we confront people on the other hand is our approach. You might even say it's our attitude. And a lot of times your attitude carries more weight than your words. Stephen Covey said a, a leader is one who climbs the tallest tree surveys the entire situation and yells, wrong jungle. When you confront somebody, it could be that you're barking up the wrong tree. You could be so adamant about the point that you want to make that maybe you can't hear God when he's saying, wrong approach. So what does it mean to speak the truth in love? How do we lovingly inspire others? Well, begin by examining your own heart first. It's like some hogs who had gathered around a feeding trough while the farmer was filling it up to the brim. One of them turned to the other and said, have you ever wondered why he's being so good to us? You know, what's, what's your motive in criticizing or confronting someone else? That's where it's got to start. Do you want to punish somebody because they didn't do something the way you thought it should be done? If you're facing off with another person to make sure that they finally get what's coming to them, then maybe you better take a look and see what has you. And if that's what's driving you, I'll tell you, if, if something other than Jesus Christ has you, then you have the wrong spirit. E. Stanley Jones said, the measure of my spirit of criticism is the measure of my distance from Christ. Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh answer word stirs up anger. So what are you trying to stir up? Hebrews 10 24 says that we are to be stirring up love and good deeds. And so is our motive in approaching people to show them the love of Christ and to encourage them to do what is right. Or is it something much different? Praise and criticism, you see, are windows to the soul. What you praise and how you criticize says a lot about you and what's going on inside of you. Lincoln also said, he has a right to criticize who has a heart to help. When you want to criticize, really, where's your heart? Do you want to help or is your goal to hurt? Andrew Stanton says, there's a difference between criticism and constructive criticism. With constructive criticism, you're constructing at the same time that you're criticizing. You're building as you're breaking down. You're making new pieces to work with out of the stuff that you've just ripped apart. You are lovingly inspiring people towards Christ, not just tearing them down with your criticism. Third, ask yourself, do you really need to speak up? How do you know whether you need to confront or not? Matthew 18, 15, Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, Go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. And so when is it a good time to talk about faults? Well, certainly not every time you're offended. The word offense comes from the Greek, which is the word for bait. In a spiritual sense, when you're tempted to be offended and overreact because somebody else maybe has been rude or inconsiderate, the devil is offering you bait. He's basically saying, okay, you get angry. Become upset. Fly off the handle. Just give them a piece of your mind. But Proverbs 19.11 says, a, what, a man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. 
And 1 Peter 4, 8, Peter says, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. And then Paul says in Colossians 3.13, Bear with each other and forgive what other grievances you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Sometimes our pride gets us into skirmishes that never need to happen. But there are some offenses too serious to overlook. And so we should ask some questions. Is this behavior by this person a bad reflection on Christ? Particularly, you know, we're asking that if they're a Christian. Is it damaging your relationship between the two of you? Even minor wrongdoing can be damaging if it's repeated all the time. Is it hurting others? Is it hurting this person themselves? You know, how can love stand back and watch another person destroy themselves or somebody else without saying something? Henry Ward Beecher said, no man can tell another his faults so as to benefit him unless he loves him. Loving people means that we want God's best for them. In some cases, that means overlooking a fault. In other cases, it means speaking up in love. Then fourth, give the benefit of the doubt. So many times we think we know what's going on before we've even talked to the other person. How many times have you just known what the other person was doing and why they were doing it, only to find out later, you were so wrong? Junk, jumping to conclusions always lands you in a lot of trouble. Did you hear about the young army lieutenant who was sitting by the colonel on a train? The colonel had just been barking at him, but across from them sat this beautiful woman next to her grandmother, and the old lady kept poking the girl every time she stole a glance over at the young lieutenant. About that time, the train went through a tunnel. It was, it was pitch black, and the only sounds you could hear were a kiss and a slap. As they came out of the tunnel, the colonel was thinking, that brash young lieutenant kissing that girl, but why did she slap me? And the grandmother was thinking the nerve of that young man, but at least she had the spunk to slap him back. And the girl was thinking, boy, I sure like that, but why did grandmother slap him? And the lieutenant was thinking, what an opportunity. I got to kiss the girl and to slap the old man. So be careful about what you assume. Always look for the best. And then finally, launch people upward with your words. We launch people either upwards or downwards with our words. Proverbs 12, 18 says, reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Reckless words end up wrecking relationships. A spirit-controlled tongue is the only thing that can steer our conversations God's way. As we speak with people, we need to pray, God, how can I lovingly inspire with as much mercy and grace as possible? We are to be primarily encouragers. Encouragers launch people upward. They build up. Hebrews 3.13, but encourage each other every day while it is today. Help each other so that none of you will become hardened because sin has tricked you. And then in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 again, let us think about each other and help each other to show love and do good deeds and encourage each other. Do this even more as you see the day coming. E. Stanley Jones, the great missionary to India, talks about a time that a group of people confronted him. He said, my destiny was in the hands of that group. I was a very bruised reed. Suppose they had broken me. I was a smoldering wick. Suppose they had snuffed me out. How did they deal with him? He says their reaction was nothing but redemptive love. That's what we need when we speak to other people to inspire them with redemptive love. Let's pray. God, I pray that you will help us to know how to receive and give loving inspiration, criticism that helps 
that builds, that nurtures your spirit within us and within others. Give us the wisdom to know how to deal with criticism that may not be expressed to us in very constructive, healing kinds of ways. Help us to discern any messages that you want us to receive that you might want to show us about ourselves that needs to change, even in how we react to what is said to us. And in turn, God, give us your spirit and your mind and your way to approach other people, to know what it is that we need to speak up and to speak with your words and in your way so that we might be an encouragement and inspirer of, of your life in the life of others who need to receive your word through us. Thank you, dear God, that you lovingly inspired us on the cross, that you gave us not just life-changing cha words, but your very life when we least deserved it. May, Lord, we be willing to give our very best, to give our life and love to others, even when they are at least deserving. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're so glad that you were with us today. I look forward to seeing you again next Sunday. We're going to be continuing our series on the kinds of prayers that Jesus answers. We hope you have a good week. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday.